Hello, welcome back. It is still Wednesday, August the 28th. My guest in this segment is Bill Carroll. Uh, Professor Bill Carroll of UVic is a sociologist with interests in the political economy and ecology of corporate capitalism, social movements, and social change. Uh, Bill, your current research is focused around the relationships between corporate power, the oil industry, and the climate crisis. Is there anything you want to add to that? That pretty well sums Sum it, it up, up and okay. it, it's bundled into a big project that involves six universities and a number of um, citizens groups uh, working in partnership, and we've been doing this since uh, 2015. Called the and Corporate the name Mapping of it, project. yeah, is the Corporate Mapping Project. Yeah. So can you tell us just a little bit about the Corporate Mapping Project and its goals? Mm -hmm. Well, we're trying to shine a light on the power of the fossil fuel industry in Canada and even beyond Canada, how it's connected to other industries and finance and into um, government power, political power, if you will, and, um, and the cultural power of, uh, of various groups like think tanks, for example, and media. So it's a wide-ranging project really looking at different types of power and focusing on the fossil fuel industry, which we take to be a very important um, um, part of the whole climate crisis. In fact, the major um, obstruction to uh, making progress uh, in this regard. About a year ago, we had on the former leader of the opposition, uh, the Liberal Opposition Party in Alberta, um, and he said basically that the fossil fuel industry, oil and gas, run the province of Alberta. If it's their way or, or you just, you're, you're out. And that's the power they have. They have enormous power, uh, particularly in Alberta. It's true, Alberta has a resemblance to petrostates such as Saudi Arabia in that regard in terms of how consolidated the power is, how this one industry tends to dominate, not just economically, but in, in, the, in the psychology and culture of Alberta. So the mapping project has released a database showing the 50 biggest agents of fossil fuel corporate power. Uh, the, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Um, what we did was initially to develop a very big database of hundreds of corporations. And, um, and through that research, we identified the real key players because the industry is highly concentrated. So uh, really, uh, most of what the action in the fossil fuel sector um, is uh, monopolized by you know, um, a handful of corporations, um, including the, um, the producers as well as the pipeline companies like Enbridge and TransCanada. Um, there's a lot of mid-sized corporations, and, and a lot of them are being mobilized right now um, behind uh, Andrew Scheer, really, and the re-election or in the election um, campaign that's uh, that's about to begin at the federal level. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a meeting held uh, not long ago in which these uh, smaller players uh, tended to um, uh, be involved uh, and uh, basically uh, trying to figure out how to coordinate um, their interests with, with the, uh, the Conservative Party's uh, interests. And you, we see this also in terms of the United Conservative Party of Alberta that uh, Jason Kenney leads and that is now in government. If I were to say that the oil and gas industry, and basically corporate Canada, runs the Conservative Party of Canada and the Liberal Party of Canada both, which are the only two parties that have ever governed Canada, would it be too much to say that Corporate Canada runs those two parties? And here in BC, the Liberal Party of BC and the NDP. Um, well, I would say that Corporate Canada, uh, broadly, not just the fossil fuel industry, the financial sector, the manufacturing, various sectors, uh, is the most powerful force in this country, and that it greatly uh, compromises the extent to which Canada can really function as a democracy. Um, so that the major um, parties, uh, liberal and conservative, are indeed, um, uh, you know, largely beholden to corporate interests. Um, uh, there are differences between them, obviously. They do compete for votes and they have slightly different projects, but, but they're both very much uh, in line with the, with the broad uh, objectives and interests of the corporate sector. Um, 
I mentioned earlier the top 50, uh, I guess, players yeah. in, the, in the industry. Um, it includes banks, think tanks, oil companies. So what, how do you get onto the top 50 list? Yeah, and who are a few players at the very top? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, as I say, we started with a very large database identifying the major corporate players in terms of uh, emitters. So these are companies that are really directly involved in the production, transportation, refining of uh, fossil fuels uh, in Canada. Uh, there are companies like um, and Canna, which has a very important uh, role, and particularly in uh, natural gas production in northeast British Columbia, for example, uh, close ties to the BC Liberal Party, um, and um, well, you know, Suncor, uh, uh, Enbridge, and TransCanada as major uh, pipeline companies. Uh, of course, the, the government of Canada now owns the TransCanada pipe uh, or the the uh, Trans Mountain pipeline and Kinder Morgan has largely exited Canada selling its assets, its other assets most recently to Pembina pipeline. Uh, so there's, there's those companies, there's and those emitters. As a, as a city dweller, the mm -hmm. ones I see are the gas stations, Esso, Shell, PetroCan. Uh, are they Absolutely. major? Absolutely. They, they are. Uh, PetroCanada is owned by Suncor. So it, it was uh, way back when a crown corporation. It was privatized years ago and now you know, although it retains the PetroCanada brand, it's a, it's a privately owned um, corporation. And it's owned by Suncor. And it's owned by that, Suncor. Right. And Esso is Exxon, I Esso understand. Esso is owned by Exxon, owned um, by uh, Imperial Oil, which is a majority owned subsidiary of ExxonMobil. Yeah. So, so there's that segment. And, and it's fairly easy to identify those players because they're, they're really big. They, they account for, you know, the economic activity of the fossil fuel sector. When you get into the uh, other categories, because uh, our basically our list of the top 50 is based on a, a certain theory of corporate power. That uh, there's more to corporate power than just economic power. So we want to look at um, the enablers of fossil fuel extraction. Um, financial enablement is really important. So the the big five Canadian banks are right at the top of the list of enablement because they provide the loan capital and they also take up investments in um, owning, uh, you know, fairly substantial blocks of shares in companies like Suncor or Enbridge or TransCanada. So it's a very tightly integrated network of ownership and financial enablement in this sense. And then there's also the enablement provided by um, the um, uh, what we call captured regulators, like the BC Oil and Gas Commission, which has a dual mandate to regulate the industry and to promote the industry. And that basically it bakes in a conflict of interest that the regulator is also, you know, attempting to help now develop. When you say right? the BC Oil and Gas Commission, this is a part of the BC provincial government. Yes. And, it is. And yet you're saying they're an enabler mm -hmm. of the oil industry and yeah. I guess essentially controlled by the oil industry. Well, they're funded by the oil industry. So they're, they're not, you know, unlike most public uh, institutions, they are funded uh, directly by the oil and gas industry. They're not funded out of uh, tax revenue. And so that, that is also an interesting feature. Interesting. It's also true of the Alberta Energy yes. Regulator, yes. funded by the industry, essentially a captured yes. regulator. So, I mean, it isn't that they're captured not... Captured and paid for. Yeah, yeah. exactly, wow. bought and paid for. And it, it isn't that they don't regulate, but they don't regulate well. And their, their interests in regulation are somewhat compromised by the fact that they also have this mandate to develop the industry. You know, so I mean, if you look at what the BC Oil and Gas Commission mostly tries to do, it's trying to reduce the amount of time it takes to approve uh, new proposals. These kinds of things it tends to turn a blind eye toward uh, major problems around, particularly fracking, because uh, in BC it's the fracking industry that's dominant in the Northeast. Companies like in Canada, as I mentioned, and um, these companies have been building um, dams to hold the enormous amounts of water that fracking requires and um, the polluted water that fracking generates, mostly underground. Fracking and pollutes huge amounts of water. Amount. They built dams. Yeah. To, I mean, 
it's unbelievable what goes on in this province mm -hmm. and is kept hidden from us as citizens. We're just, yeah. we don't matter, which is exactly the power of the, of the corporation. Yeah. We and, don't matter. And, you know, our project is trying to shine a light on that. So, I mean, it is, it's possible to develop the information, try to get the information out. It's an uphill struggle because, you know, uh, the corporate media don't tend to pay attention that much to these issues, well, right? Certainly not going to pay attention to somebody who is criticizing the people who own the corporate media, which are the same people who own the oil and gas industry. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation for us citizens, or we're not citizens anymore, taxpayers. We've been demoted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 hold, hold on, I hold on to that concept of citizenship. I think it's very important not to buy into that kind of discourse of, you know, low tax regime and we're all just taxpayers interested in how much money we're keeping in our wallets. We need to rekindle uh, a, a concern about the public sphere and a concern about our, our shared fate, you know, because that, that's integral to democracy. Once that goes, I don't know what we have. We're just consumers and taxpayers, as you say. Which is exactly, I think, what they want us to be. Um, what is the role of the oil and gas industry and these powerful corporate interests here in British Columbia, separate from Alberta? Yeah. Well, as I say, in BC, the, the key resource is natural gas. It's, it's underground, mainly in the northeast of BC and there's an enormous amount of fracking. It's, it's all basically fracked gas. There's, you know, there's, um, so, so the hydraulic fracturing that takes place underground is the way to get this out of these pockets you know, um, of underground uh, uh, shale gas. Um, and it's, um, it, it, it's an enormously polluting industry. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's tied in with the whole dream of LNG, right? You know, like trying to, um, basically extract the natural gas, pipe it to the coast, right, and then um, um, super freeze it for transport overseas. Um, very, very expensive, very energy intensive actually. You know, it's producing energy, but it's taking an enormous amount of energy to produce it. One of the interesting things about BC fracked gas is that a lot of it actually doesn't go west to the coast. It goes east to the tar sands. It's used as energy to power the extraction of bitumen, and secondly, to dilute the, the bitumen, the so-called wet gas, that is one of the things that is extracted in the northeast of BC, is piped to um, Alberta and used to dilute the bitumen so that it can actually flow in the pipelines, including the Trans Mountain pipeline, to Burnaby. So it's interesting to think about that because it exposes a certain hypocrisy of the current BC government that prides no. itself on being they are environmentalist so hypocritical. And, and prides itself on being, yes. you know, um, opposed to the Trans Mountain pipeline and everything. And yet, what it's actually what, part of what's going on here is an enablement of the tar sands by the fracked gas that's being extracted in the northeast of uh, British Columbia. And another story that we're basically not told about in our, in our media who don't want us to know about it. Um, how big is fracking in northeastern BC? Because that's something else we don't hear about. How big is the industry? It's an enormous industry. It, 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 um, I mean, these industries, um, it's interesting because you can measure them in terms of revenue. There's an enormous amount of money being generated. Uh, but in terms of the number of jobs, it's relatively modest because all of these industries, oil and gas, uh, coal much less so, but certainly oil and gas, where most of the action is, um, are capital intensive. So they actually employ relatively few workers per dollar being generated, right? Uh, the entire um, Alberta industry uh, directly em employs about uh, 20,000 workers. And that's a relatively small segment of even the Alberta labor force. So there's, there's often a bit of uh, distortion about that, too, that there is, I mean, there are jobs at stake in any kind of industrial restructuring. And in my view, we need to fundamentally restructure away from the extraction of carbon fuels. We need to keep that stuff in the ground and move to uh, renewable energy uh, as quickly as possible. Um, which is feasible and would actually set Canada 
um, rather well in terms of the future. But you know, the fly in the ointment is the, the, the corporate power. mapping project, yes. the entrenched power of the corporate sector, yeah. which doesn't care what the public wants, but they intend to make as much money out of what they've got until, uh, until the last days. Yeah. which are coming quickly, it seems. It's, it's frustrating and rather tragic, really, because, I mean, these, uh, these for example, the, the pipeline that um, um, perhaps will be built, right, the, the twinning of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, Kinder Morgan and all of that. If that actually gets built, <coughs> by the time it's built, it's not clear that there will be demand for the resource. No, I you know? wouldn't think there would be. So it's an enormous waste of time and energy if, if that's how it pans out. If there is demand and it ends up transporting that stuff, that's even worse because we, what we need to be doing is shifting away from, you yes. know. Uh, Bill, well, we got through uh, about a quarter of the questions and we're out of time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And maybe you can come back on and we'll finish off uh, <laughs> the corporate well, mapping project before they finish us off. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Jack, yeah, okay. that part of it. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Bye-bye. Thank you.